Please join me in taking your Bibles and turning to Daniel chapter 1 as we continue our series of messages on Forged in Fire. Uh, I've really enjoyed searching out and looking at some of these Bible characters whose lives uh, were not uh, absent from a little adversity and difficulty, and we can see how God would use these circumstances to mold them into the great Bible characters that they are today. We still admire their lives and their testimonies, and of course, uh, their stories have been told thousands and thousands of times in various settings, including in messages like this that we'll be looking at today. So we're in Daniel chapter 1. Obviously, Daniel himself is the subject of our message today on Forged in Fire. And we'll read the first eight verses for our text passage. And of course, I'll be alluding to some other events in Daniel's life in short order. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had an, uh, ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. And then it says this in verse number eight, and it's a critical point of our message today. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. What a testimony. Is the world not in need today of people who would determine that they're going to live for God, seek to live a righteous life, and not defile themselves with the world's influence? I don't care if a person is saved or he's lost, or if a person has a great and high regard for the Bible or would refute everything that the Bible has to say. I don't care if the person is a person of integrity or not. Today, almost everybody respects someone who would live their lives with high moral character. And that person need not be famous or well-known or influential, but if he stands true to his principles and he does not waver like the wave of the sea, nor is he driven of the wind and, the, and tossed, as James 1 verse 6 says, then he will be admired and respected and looked up to among even the lost in the community. And Daniel was just such a man. Years later, when the Lord was pronouncing judgment upon Israel, he summoned the prophet Ezekiel to deliver a message to the people. And listen to what Ezekiel said in Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing, trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out mine hand upon it, and will break the staff of the bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and I will cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, speaking of in the world, in these wicked and sinful settings, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. So interestingly, later on, God would summon Ezekiel to refer to three men, one of only three men in all of history to that point, Noah and Daniel, and of course, Job, and speak about their righteousness, and even to intimate that perhaps the entire nation could have been spared from judgment if the people would have followed the example of just one of these three great men, one of them being Daniel. Of course, this was not the case, and are sitting here in our text, the nation of Israel is being judged for their, righteous, their unrighteousness and forsaking the Lord, 
and uh, judgment would fall in the place of the Babylonians in this particular context. But Daniel had been particularly helpful in inspiring the people of his generation. And all these years later, uh, he still inspires us. And in, in particular, young men can learn a lot from the example of Daniel because of what he did in this setting while he was still a teenager and how he demonstrated outstanding courage and determination in the face of so much peer pressure. I used to travel uh, years ago in the summers, and I would spend every summer uh, of the, every week of the summer in churches across America and in youth groups in their respective churches, and I would preach on Daniel all summer long, every week, in every church, every opportunity I got a chance to do so, among teenagers to inspire young people to take a stand and do what is right in the face of adversity. If we had more young men in our nation today like Daniel, it could literally turn our country back to God. Men who were uncompromising in their convictions and willing to do whatever it took to stand for the Lord. I think it was Ron Hamilton who uh, encouraged us all to dare to be a Daniel, to be like Daniel in our convictions. Daniel's character was forged in fire at an apparent young age here. And these challenges and tests that he faced would forge his character and prepare for greater battles down the road. And he remained faithful to God throughout his entire lifetime. And we're allowed to get a glimpse into Daniel's life and, and to see what happened. I want to look at just three settings today, one of them here in our text passage, and we'll look at a couple other that are also familiar to most of you, and see how God forged Daniel's character and made him the man that he ultimately became. The first setting I want you to look at is changes with lifestyle. Changes with lifestyle. Daniel was one of only four Hebrew young men who were named in Scripture, who were taken captive from Jerusalem and brought back to Babylon for the explicit purpose of being um, meshed with and fashioned into the way of the Babylonian lifestyle. And they received this special training. For all appearances, they appear to be exceptional young men, and Daniel is included among those four men. He appeared to be uh, physically fit, uh, you know, mentally or intellectually sharp, uh, these are young men who seem to have some leadership ability. They were very broad in their interests and very well-schooled and well-educated. Uh, they had knowledge of science and perhaps other subjects as well. And they were the kind of men that the king of Babylon was looking for to adapt and to learn from and to perhaps challenge his own young generation in his empire. They were handpicked for a specific purpose when they were brought. But imagine the culture shock for young men like Daniel to be brought from Jerusalem in a basically a rural or agricultural environment and brought back to this tremendous city and this place of high culture and tremendous architecture. Uh, Babylon was built on a flat plain, but it was a huge defensed city. It was shaped like a square for defense purposes, and each side was 14 miles long interspersed among the perimeter of that city, which, by the way, was so wide that history records the fact that they held chariot races on the top of the wall. That's how thick and wide the wall was, and it was extremely tall. And interspersed on that wall were 100 gates leading in and out of the city made entirely of bronze. There were also 200 towers across the city wall. They used that to look out over the landscape to see if there was an attacking enemy, uh, to, to keep an eye on things in terms of their city's defense. The engineers who designed the city made sure that it was built over the Euphrates River. Therefore, in the event that the city was besieged, which was not uncommon during that day, and by the way, Babylon was rarely done so because of their military prowess, but if the city was in fact besieged, they would have a water source and a food source running right under their city uh, and they could fish for food and get fresh water when they needed it. Within the city confines, there were hundreds of palaces and temples that were elaborate and a sight to see. Many of them were taller than the pyramids of Egypt, if you can imagine that. So, you know, 
a city 14 miles square with these elaborate buildings and edifices in there. And the, probably the most unique thing there was the hanging gardens because the king of Babylon sensed that his wife was homesick, homesick for her, her country environment where there were mountains and green hills. And so he built tiered gardens in there, hanging gardens, that they created all types of, of plant life and, and it looked like a mountainside literally within the confines of the city built upon a plain. And the king went through all these elaborate details to please his wife and to make sure she was not homesick for her country. This magnificent city would become the setting for Daniel's early testing. And as soon as he got there, the indoctrination started right away. They brought him in and tried to change who he was as a person. We need to realize that when we are going through these life changes, these new environments that we get and these transitions in life, it is then that we're most susceptible to compromise in our lives. When we get into a different group, a different work environment, a different school for our young people, a uh, different community, uh, it is then that we have to adapt to all the change and it's our nature to want to fit in, to do what everybody else is doing, to be liked, to be valued by other people. And it is then when the temptation to compromise it is at its highest. I've read that during World War II, when the Russian troops were making their way across Europe and heading to Germany, that the Soviet leadership took them aside and, and literally issued a proclamation to them and warned them about the dangers of adapting the principles and customs of the nations they were to overcome. It was a difficult task for the invading soldiers not to adapt to that life. It is much difficult for us as Christians to, to, to not do so, to be like the world, so to speak. And imagine Daniel and these other Hebrew young men brought to this environment and uh, the temptation was so strong to do what everybody else was doing and to go along with the program and uh, to change many things about their lives. The temptation to conform was extremely strong during that time. A few weeks ago, one of my grandsons came up to me and he had a book on interesting facts about, uh, well, some of them involve science and nature and so forth. And I opened up, he was showing me several of the pages. I opened up a page and I recognized a chameleon lizard and I read the write-up about the chameleon. And it stated in the book that a chameleon lizard can completely change his color in as little as 20 seconds. Well, I've known some Christians who have taken less time than that to completely change their colors as well. We are very easily influenced by the world. The first thing that Daniel and his friends confronted when they arrived in Babylon was uh, an invitation to sit at the king's table, which should have been considered an honor. And they placed before him, before these Daniel and his friends, some wine which had been used in idolatrous worship and, and some foods which would violate their conscience and their dietary habits and restrictions. And and uh, they were suddenly in a situation where they had to make a decision. Are we going to eat this food and drink this wine? It's been placed before us. What would they do? What would Daniel do? I suppose many of us would have been tempted in that setting to put off that kind of a decision until later on. You know, just sort of not make any waves initially, just to maybe have a time to process this and think about it and perhaps approach the leadership or those overseeing our lives and explain our convictions later and so forth. But had, had Daniel violated his conscience in that setting, it would have been a tremendous blow to his testimony. You see, the key to our holding convictions is that they are important to us. There is a reason behind them, and we're not going to change with every whim uh, and every circumstance that comes into our lives. We're going to hold true to what we believe and demonstrate to others that there's some things we can do and there's some things we absolutely cannot do. And folks, we've got to make those decisions before we get into those tempting situations. We've got to decide what is right, what God would have us to do, what is clearly spelled out in God's word. And we need to have those decisions made ahead of time so that when we get in those settings in life where we're tempted to do something that may violate our conscience, we've already decided, we've already made the decision ahead of time. We know what we're going to do. And we're going to hold to our convictions and do that which would please the Lord. Satan has won half the battle in our lives if he can get us to delay 
to do the right thing. To make these subtle compromises that come about regularly in all of our lives and then decide, well, I'll take a stand on this and figure it out later on. But right now, I'm right here, and this situation affords itself, and I don't want to ruffle any feathers or offend anybody. I'm just going to go along with the program. Well, if Satan can get us to adopt that attitude about those settings, I guarantee you the battle is half done in our lives. Daniel could have rationalized a lot of things about his situation then. He was taken against his will and brought to a foreign country. Everything was new to him. They even changed his name. His identity was being impacted here. And uh, he could have looked down the road and said, you know, it's important for me to try to fit in here and do what everybody else is doing. Uh, This is a new phase of my life. You know, what if I decide I'm not going to do this? Are there going to be some repercussions for this? Will they, will they put me among the general population of young men who are just doing, well, they became indentured servants. They begin uh, a new life of servanthood for the rest of their lives. Daniel was given this high responsibility in the king's palace with special privileges afforded to him. And he knew he could have lost all of that if he took his stand and did what was right by his conscience. But he stood true to his principles. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. You know, for our young people who may be listening to this uh, podcast, uh, you have to realize that there'll be times in your life where you'll have to learn to say no. Uh, I don't mean in regard to your parents or authority figures, and by all means, please, if God implores you to do something or impresses upon your heart the need to do something, Uh, develop a pattern early in your life where you're going to say yes to God all the time, every time, in every setting. But what I'm talking about is there'll be times in your life and you need to learn the valuable lesson that you're going to stand up and say no in these settings where you're tempted to violate your, your convictions and your conscience and do that which is forbidden in God's word. You need to learn simply to say, no, I'm not going to do that. To learn from Daniel's example. And God will reward you and bless you for your stand. Look what it says down in verse 20 of that chapter. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. Daniel not only was blessed and benefited by God because of his position, but he earned the, he earned the respect and admiration of others, even those who are in authority in his life. I don't have to tell you this, but we're all living in a very corrupt, sinful, fallen, wicked world. And there are people out there that want nothing to do with the Bible, that disdain God and his authority, that have no regard or respect for the fact that Jesus Christ gave his life to pay for their sins and to provide them with an opportunity to be saved. They have no regard for that, no concern for that. And they don't appreciate your faith. And they will try at every turn to get you to falter in your convictions. It eases their conscience, does it not? It makes them feel better about themselves. And if they can see Christians who will falter in their faith, they're thinking in the back of their minds, maybe I will not have to give an account to a God, a holy God one day a God who will judge me for my sin. But those same people will hold a high regard and a respect for people who stand by their principles. And there's no secret to knowing how Daniel was able to maintain his testimony and his integrity during these trying times. It is simply this. Daniel was a man of prayer. He kept in close fellowship with his God. He worshiped his God and he He sought out strength and wisdom and instruction from God on a daily basis. When Jesus took Peter, James, and John into the Garden of Gethsemane for his time of severe testing, he asked them to stay and to watch and pray for a little while. But while Jesus went to pray, in fact, the Bible says in the Gospels that he was earnestly praying, the disciples were asleep. And that's why they would soon falter in their own convictions and violate their own conscience, and were not men at that point of their lives of great integrity. You see, praying will keep us faithful to God. This decision to acquire the 
discipline of prayer would factor into Daniel's life later on in, in many, many respects. But we need to realize that we must fight off temptation in our lives. And if we do so, we can stand and be respected even by the lost world, just as Daniel was. You know, this is not an option for us, really, in our Christian lives. It's an obligation. I'll say this. It's a privilege for us to take our stand for the Lord and let the consequences be what they may be to do the right thing in every situation of life. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20 reminds us, What know you not that your body is the temple of, of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, the Bible says? For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So Daniel was able to remain faithful and stand true and absorb this tremendous test in his life, even at an early age, with regard to changes in his lifestyle. But I want you to see a second setting where he, again, he was being forged by God and made into the man that God wanted him to become. And that involves, secondly, challenges with leaders. Now, I'm not going to say a lot under this point. I would encourage you to pick up the book of Daniel. It's not a long book and read some of the things that he went through. But if you read through the pages of the book of Daniel, you'll find out that Daniel, perhaps because he began his service to kings at such an early age and he lived a good long life, he was able to actually serve under three prominent, well-known historical kings. And he was faithful to his God under each one of them. The first one, of course, was Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel was called to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dreams shortly after this setting in chapter 1. And you can read the scriptures and find out how he performed under that particular very difficult test. And then he served under Belshazzar. And uh, he was, Daniel was sent by God to uh, confront Belshazzar about his sinfulness and pronounce a judgment upon his life. That took courage, I can assure you of that. And then... Later on, he served under Darius, who was the king of the Medes and the Persians. So Daniel served under three very prominent, well-known historical kings and demonstrated his faithfulness to God in the face of adversity among every one of them. He never wavered in his convictions. Every one of those kings found him to be a man of high moral standing and character and courage. And even though he was a Hebrew and brought to their country just as a servant, he became indispensable to these kings. All of them recognized there was something different about Daniel. And they all wanted him around. And they all called out for him in times of need and desperation as a man that was acting on God's behalf. And it literally changed their convictions about the Hebrew God, Jehovah, and about who it is that they should follow in their personal lives. All of these kings had people working with them, however, who didn't appreciate Daniel. There's always opposition when we take a stand for the Lord, and they were jealous of him and suspicious of him, and difficulties arose in his life because of that. But no matter who was on the throne, Daniel served God faithfully. And the point is this, that Daniel endured many life transitions, still by remaining faithful to his God. That was the one constant in his life. You know, things are going to change for us. We're going to go through stages in our own lives, and we're going to uh, some of us see really uh, extreme changes in, in various areas of our lives. And as our families develop and grow and go, uh, and uh, we, we face challenges and difficulties, the one stable constant in Daniel's life was his worship of God. And that's because we serve a God who never changes. And that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Sometimes an unexpected turn in of events in a Christian's life sends him into a tailspin. But Daniel's character was forged early in life and continued to grow as he walked with God after year after year after year. And so he was able to stand true to his principles because of his relationship with God. I wonder how we're doing with that in our own lives. So we see Daniel being forged with changes in lifestyle, with challenges with leaders, at least three different kings and many other men in authority in his life. He remained faithful and constant. But I want you to see the final setting where God was forging his life and his character. And that's why he's contending with lions. This story is perhaps the story that Daniel is most known for. His uh, episode in the den of lions. 
and how he remained faithful in that particular setting. It's found in Daniel chapter 6, and you can read that at your convenience. But it occurred under the leadership of a king by the name of Darius. And it centered on Daniel's determination to pray even when it was not allowed to do so. Remember I said earlier that David's character was forged because of his prayer life and his daily commitment to God and his communication with his God. And his courage arose from that setting. Well, that very setting of prayer became a matter of conflict in his life. Daniel had some enemies who conspired to have him killed. And uh, there are just people out there like that. I don't know what to tell you. We can't avoid them. They're people that just don't like anything that we uh, believe about in the Lord Jesus Christ and our, and our obedience to God's word. And when we would challenge them on their lifestyle or teach them what the word of God tells us about living our lives, they become very, uh, not just belligerent, sometimes they become vicious. And such was the case of Daniel. You know, the Bible warns us in Proverbs 27, verse 4, Wrath is cruel, and anger is outrageous, the Bible says, but who is able to stand against envy? And when these, you know, peers and people existing within the nation of Babylon saw how Daniel was elevated to a position of authority, and he was given great influence and great power and freedom, and he aided the kings in their various challenges in life. There were other people in the nation who envied Daniel for this position of prominence. And they, and they made plans to basically do away with him. They wanted him killed. And so they conspired against him. And they, choose, they chose uh, the venue of prayer to do that. And Daniel had to make a choice here. Would he be faithful to his God and pray? Or would he be loyal to the laws of the land? Uh, this is something not unfamiliar to many of us today. Uh, what are we going to do? Are we going to remain faithful to God or faithful to man? Well, who, who are we going to serve? Who will hold our ultimate allegiance in life? Well, what would Daniel do when they said you can no longer pray to anybody but the king? You know, Daniel had developed a pattern over the course of many years of praying to God. And he had to make a, cho he had to make a choice. And so he went, went to his house as he normally did. He opened his window as he often did. He prayed publicly in clear view of others, just as he had always done. The Bible says, as he did aforetime. And as a result, he was arrested. Condemnation was set in place. He was convicted and thrown into a den of lions. He could have compromised. For instance, he could have said, well, I'll just put off prayer for a while and wait to see what happens and just kind of lay low a little bit here. Or he could have gone home and gone into his prayer closet, could he not? He could have, he could have refused to open the, the window by his house and pray publicly. He could, have just, he could have gone privately and nobody would have known he was praying. But see, all of these areas are subtle compromises. And Daniel was a man, whatever else he was, he was a man of conviction. He had his convictions. He knew what was right and nothing would deter him from doing what was right. He would not violate his conscience. And so he threw those windows open and he prayed just as he'd always done before. And he was arrested because of it. I've often joked about uh, Christians going into public venues like a restaurant and reaching that point before they eat their meal, where they bow their heads before others and pray. And I guess years ago, you could have done that. And whether other people were Christians or not, whether they would pray or not, whether they appreciated it or not, I guess it wouldn't be such a big deal uh, to see someone praying in a restaurant. But nowadays, I have to be honest with you. Nowadays, I very rarely see people praying for their meal in public restaurants. You just don't see it happen very much. We do, of course. I know many of you do, but it's rare. I'm not just talking about dropping your fork and, you know, uttering a prayer under your breath as you reach for your fork and coming back up and digging in. I'm talking about bowing your head and verbally praying and thanking God and acknowledging God's role in your life. And as a testimony to those, many of whom will probably be lost around you, letting them know where you stand, who you belong to. And 
praying directly to Jesus Christ and thanking God for your meal. Um, it's hard to find Christians with those kind of convictions. And if you can, in, you know, breathe that into your children, those deep-seated convictions that it's okay in public to let other people see you praying and asking God and thanking God. Uh, those types of values will change the character of your children. In effect, forge their character, just as we're looking at in all of these Bible characters. You know, the main point from Daniel's perspective in this whole story of Daniel with the den of lions is not that God miraculously spared his life. And it was a, it's a wonderful story. That's why we teach it in junior church and Sunday school and have done so for years. It's, that's not the main point from Daniel's perspective. The main point from Daniel's perspective is this is even if that day he would have been eaten by wild beasts, lions, even if that day he would have died when he was cast into that den of lions, he would have still stood for his convictions. And that's really what mattered to Daniel. Not that God performed the miracle, but that God loved him and had a plan for his life and he wasn't going to violate his convictions. What a challenge to each of us. We're all given opportunities in the course of our week to take a stand for the Lord. And we're all uh, pummeled with uh, ch challenges and temptations to compromise our convictions and, and, and what we say and how we relate to others and how we live our lives before a lost world. And, and many times it's very difficult for many of you. I understand that. You're in settings where not only would they frown upon your Christian convictions, they openly criticize it. Maybe you're in settings actually in work environments or other places where some of the things that you want to do and feel important to do as a child of God are clearly forbidden. They're against protocol or procedures for the places of employment where you go to every week. And I don't stand here to pretend to tell you or to judge you about what you should do, but I can tell you this, Daniel never wavered in his faith and his commitment to God and because of that, from a young age, God began to reward him and bless him and use him in a great way. He changed the complexion of an entire nation, the greatest nation at the time. He had the most powerful kings in the world beckoning for his help and his advice and his wisdom because Daniel was a man of conviction. May we all learn from that and aspire to be a Daniel as well. Let's pray to that end. Father, we thank you so much for this great example we see in the life of Daniel. And uh, he was truly a man who purposed in his heart. And he never wavered from his strong convictions. And he, he had that daily time where he prayed to you and reverenced you and feared you and honored you with his life. And that influenced so many people, just the people we know about in Scripture. Before Daniel's life is over, we have, we have kings submitting to the God of Daniel. We have kings, kings converting in their theology, and we have nations that are impacted because of this one man's testimony, because he was a man of conviction. And Lord, as you give us opportunities to take a stand for you, and as we raise our children, the very next generation of Christian leaders, help us to, embree, in, in, uh, to breed within their lives a sense of conviction about what is right, and about the consequences of violating our conscience. Help us, Lord, to set that example ourselves as adults and to live out our lives openly um, and honestly in submission to you and lifting up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter what the consequences may be. And we'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, bless you and challenge you as you are given opportunities even this week to take a stand for the Lord. You be faithful to do so.